welcome uh, to our webinar. Uh, if you'll see it's being recorded. So if you click got it, that'll keep you moving. Um, I'm going to talk today about Washington State overdose death trends. And my name is Caleb Banter Green. I work at the University of Washington. I'm an acting professor at the Addictions, Drug, and Alcohol Institute. And I'm also the director of the Center for Community Engaged Drug Education, Epidemiology, and Research. And we are in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in the School of Medication and School of Medicine at UW. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, Washington State overdose death trends and also want to let folks know that we're today using a Zoom webinar. It's not a meeting, so only the host can share video and audio. We can't see or hear participants, but please enter questions in the um, Q&A section or in the chat. You don't need to enter your name and title. And um, Susan Kingston, who's working with us, will monitor that. And if there are important kind of clarifying questions, um, I will try to pause and answer those. And we'll also have some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and the webinar will be recorded and shared in the next few days. So I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge that we are meeting virtually on the traditional territories of hundreds of indigenous nations with many areas covered by treaties that were signed by the United States and tribes before many states even existed as such. The employees of the state of Washington are guided by the Centennial Accord and state law, respecting and affirming tribal sovereignty and working with our tribal governments throughout the state in government to government partnerships. So conflicts of interest in funding, I have no conflicts of interest to report. Do not, I do not accept funding from pharmaceutical companies. And if I mention any trade or brand names, it's just for educational identification purposes. Current funding for um, my work is the Washington State Healthcare Authority, Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery, both with some state funds and some federal funds. Um, and NIH, National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, working with a couple of other folks on some projects. And we have a new project starting with them in about a week and a half. And just wrapping up a project from the Pew Trust evaluating the Olympia Butte Clinic. And then we also have funding from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, Primera, Washington State Healthcare Authority, and Seattle Foundation for our low barrier buprenorphine um, access work, which I won't go into detail on today, just to share with you what our funding sources are. I, before I go into all of this, since today is really going to be about data, I really need to acknowledge my colleague Jason Williams, who has put all of these data visualizations together for Washington State. They're amazing. Um, he's both working with the data, thinking about how to analyze them, thinking about questions, and creating these visualizations online that I think are really useful, really added value, and also allow people to sort of access and flood information that's particularly interest, um, interesting to them. And I'll show you that web page, these web pages in a moment. But most of the data slides you'll see for Washington State are pulled directly off of our web page and created by Jason. And Jason is a research scientist here at ADAI. So today's presentation uh, is about current overdose death trends in Washington State, what substances are involved in overdose, fentanyl basics, and key points of community education, and a little bit about xylazine, which we're just starting to hear about. And um, I'll share that, you know, so. We have this community engaged uh, drug education, epidemiology and research group. And today I'm really gonna be focused on the epidemiology side, um, which is super important sort of what's going on. What I'm not gonna have time to talk about today, but I also love to talk about and work on is um, so what and what do we do about it? Uh, that's not the topic of today's conversation, but I will point to some uh, resources on the so what and what to do about it aspect of this. So on our uh, webpage and our body of work includes sort of this epidemiology, the data I'm gonna share with you today. We have a lot of sort of public facing information for patients, clients, participants, as well as staff and providers. The main web pages we have are stopoverdose.org, learnabouttreatment.org. Um, we also have, and I'll show a little bit from some community surveys with people who use drugs. We're also increasingly doing qualitative um, interviews with folks. And then also we have an annual Transforming Our Communities annual gathering um, that is really a wonderful place to come together. That'll be next June, will be our fourth annual, I believe. Um, and uh, really encourage people to participate in that. So just some background on sort of who we are. And uh, this is just to orient you to what this data page looks like. Here's the URL for it. It's just the ADI web page plus raw data. And you'll see the data are organized by geography, drug type, indicator source, um, we pull on a lot of different data sources. I'll mention that um, I was 
brought back to the University of Washington in the fall of 2001, so a long time ago, uh, because of what was happening with methamphetamine. We immediately also started seeing what's happening with pharmaceutical opioids, then heroin, uh, and now fentanyl. And so things are changing quicker and quicker. I mean, you'll see that in these data, which I think is gonna make these online data really important for folks. And we'll be continuing to try to provide more resources um, as we learn about new things like xyosine and other substances that are, that are coming out. So I encourage people just to know about this webpage. All the Washington State data slides I'm gonna share with you today are on this webpage. I'm gonna start off by focusing um, on fatal overdoses. I'm gonna um, unpeel the onion in some other areas as well with some other data sources, but we're gonna start with and focus on fatal overdose deaths. And let me explain what these are. These are deaths that um, are due to the acute intoxication with drugs. Um, they're not uh, motor vehicle fatalities, they're not um, liver, liver failure or hepatitis C, it's acute intoxication, what we think of colloquially as an overdose, um, also often called a poisoning. I do wanna share, because this comes up a lot, overdose to me, sort of medically just means more dose than a body can handle. There often is this connotation about it somehow being associated with misuse, abuse, or addiction. And I wanna be really clear, we can't discern that from deaths. We don't know in these deaths, these social and personal and other factors uh, going on in people's lives. Also really importantly, we don't know if people have substance use disorder or dependence or history with these drugs. So we don't know if this is the first time a person has used this drug or the 10,000th. Um, so with all of that, I do think there is important information from these mortality data. They're pretty representative of the entire population of Washington state. There are some biases in terms of which deaths get uh, recorded as drug caused deaths, but they're a pretty good data source uh, for the entire state. And of course, they generally represent just sort of the tip of the iceberg. And we usually think about mortality data as what I call a lagging indicator. Um, you know, there's a new trend coming on. You often don't see an increase in deaths for many years. And what we're seeing with fentanyl is really um, I'll turn that apple cart in terms of really now we're seeing that these mortality numbers for fentanyl are really closely related with new populations and new places using this drug because it is so lethal. So this is again from our webpage, looking at a very high level, stepping back. These are drug cause death rates per 100,000 state residents. So the Y axis on the left side is deaths per um, 100,000 people um, going up to uh, 40 per 100,000. The black line is all drug poisoning deaths. So this is all, all deaths combined in terms of the drug poisonings. And you can see sort of a, a bit of an increase in 2003 through 2008, things kind of leveled off, started increasing again around 2015 a bit, and then just a dramatic increase in the last couple of years. So that's the black line, that's all drug cause deaths. The red line is opioids, and I'll talk a lot more about that. That's fentanyl, that's pharmaceutical opioids like oxycodone and hydrocodone, um, as well as illicitly manufactured opioids um, such as fentanyl. So the red line is all of those opioids combined, relatively steady over the last 15 plus years, even as the type of opioid has shifted dramatically until the last two years, where we just see unprecedented increases uh, in, in overdose deaths, about a 30% increase in each of the last two years in deaths involving opioids. The dark blue line or the medium blue line with the squares, that's methamphetamine. It's technically psychostimulants with abuse potential. It's basically methamphetamine. Um, and you can see really steady increases, but again, an uptick in the last couple of years that is in part related to fentanyl, not entirely. And then you can see cocaine as well um, was actually more prevalent, more common than methamphetamine uh, in the mid 2000s. Methamphetamine sort of overtook it. Cocaine numbers were actually fairly low. They have come up a bit in the last couple of years. So that's just really high level, the overall overdose death trends. And I should say, I'm really going to focus today um, on illicit substances. I should mention that we, alcohol as a, as a drug poisoning will be included in these data. Um, it is very uncommon for a person to die from alcohol by itself. A person would commonly need to get to a blood alcohol level, level of about 0.4. Um, we're more likely to see alcohol in combination with other substances. So alcohol poisonings are involved. They are present in these data, but there's almost always in combination with other substances. And then I often get asked about THC or cannabis products, and we really do not see overdose deaths due to uh, directly in THC. And in fact, most medical examiners don't include it in the death certificate reporting because of that. So the main classes of drugs we'll be looking at are opioids, 
methamphetamine and cocaine. I'll talk a little bit about alcohol, benzodiazepines, and barbiturates later, but mostly focused on opioids and methamphetamine today. I do want to share these data that are a little bit dated. Um, this is back through 2015 through 2019. Drug overdose deaths overall disproportionately affect American Indian and Alaska Native populations. That's the leftmost column here. You can see the mortality, age-adjusted mortality rate of about 50 per 100,000 compared to uh, probably around 17, 18 for white non-Hispanic. So a dramatic overrepresentation in drug cause deaths for American Indian and Alaska Natives. And this is very likely an underreporting or an underestimate of that rate due to a lot of problems with coding around race and ethnicity um, in mortality data. So real disproportionality there. And I'll talk a little bit more about disproportionality with specific substances in a bit. So this is a more complicated graph of the one I showed previously. This is showing drug combinations, and I'll take a little time to, to tease this one apart. These are data, again, from 2003 through 2021. This is the deaths per 100,000. So all drug poisonings, that's the cumulative um, uh, prevalence across all of these substances, is about 30 per 100,000. And you can see the real dramatic increase in the rate. So this does adjust for population. You can see increases for sure over the last handful of years, but then dramatic increases the last couple of years. So looking at this um, from the bottom up, looking at the dark red, that red categorization, that category, the largest category is opioids without cocaine or methamphetamine. The orange is um, a combination of opioids, uh, cocaine, and methamphetamine. And then the, the largest other group we see up here, blue, is actually methamphetamine without cocaine or opioids. It's a little hard just to see here because there's so many different colors that are similar, but I encourage you to go online as well and you can really sort of tease apart and see these different categories. But what we're really seeing are combinations of um, uh, either opioids by itself, methamphetamine by itself, uh, or in fact, I apologize, this orange here is actually opioids and methamphetamine. So do take a look at that online. Looking at the methamphetamine involved deaths, I'm just going to share two slides around methamphetamine in particular. What you're really seeing here is a huge increase in the, in the rate and the number. Uh, last year, we had over 1,200 people die from methamphetamine involved overdose deaths. Um, that's basically double the number we saw in 2019. So a massive increase in a short period of time. The orange shading here right here is indicative of opioids and methamphetamine. So part of this is this combination of opioids and methamphetamine. But this blue shading here is methamphetamine uh, by itself without cocaine, opioids, alcohol. ABB is alcohol, benzodiazepines, or barbiturates, those are sedating substances. So large increases in opioids plus methamphetamine and also large increases in methamphetamine by itself. Again, I encourage you to go online, but this is a large numerical and proportional increase and methamphetamine only deaths as well. Really important, we have a lot of information on stopoverdose.org. There's a long-standing misheld belief that you cannot overdose on methamphetamine by itself. That is not correct. Uh, you can, in fact, overdose on methamphetamine uh, by itself, as well as in combination. A little bit about what we're seeing uh, across the state over a couple decade period, you can see the overdose death rate increasing almost tenfold from 1.5 to 13.2. You can see these relatively low rates across the state, um, sort of an outlier here in a small county, and then really dramatically higher rates across much of the state over the last few years. So you get some sense of the geographic variability, and there is geographic variability. We definitely see higher rates in some areas. You can see the Olympic Peninsula in particular, um, but we've also seen increases across most of the state. And then just to describe a little bit sort of narratively what we're seeing, and there's detailed numbers available on the web page. As I said, the absolute number of deaths involving methamphetamine has increased massively from 89 to 1,235. The median age has increased quite a bit from 40 to 49. It continues to be mostly men. It was 73% men who died in, in 2021. That's pretty similar to what we've seen for the last couple of decades. The proportion of methamphetamine involved deaths that also involve opioids has increased over time from about a third to over half. Very importantly, uh, a big decrease in the proportion who uh, are identified as being white from 91% to 76%. We see particular increases among black and Hispanic populations, 
And we've actually seen pretty consistent trends in terms of overrepresentation in methamphetamine deaths, with about 6% of methamphetamine deaths over the past two decades involving American Indian Alaskan Natives, which is about three times the population that we see in the state overall. So that's really sort of an overview of what we're seeing um, with methamphetamine. I will mention that um, we believe that most of the methamphetamine involved in deaths and being used generally is smoked. We also do see it to some degree being injected as well, often in combination with opioids. The route of administration and combinations are shifting pretty quickly in, in large part due to what we're seeing with fentanyl. Okay, switching topics and taking a sip of water. <clears throat> so this is this uh, same graph. This is state opioid death rates, um, but it's focused just on opioids. You can see the rate on the left side. The red line is any opioid, and that's increased from about 6 to 22 per 100,000. So a dramatic increase in opioid overdose death rates. Um, I won't go, well, I will, I will break it down a little bit. So the green line are um, commonly prescribed opioids. Again, that's largely oxycodone, hydrocodone, morphine, methadone, those substances. We saw dramatic increases uh, in the 2000s and really reaching a peak in the mid late uh, 2010 or so period and then declining, but not disappearing by any stretch. We don't talk about it a lot, um, but we are continue to see pharmaceutical opioid involved overdose deaths. Um, we don't have great data, unfortunately, about what proportion of those folks were prescribed that opioid or not, whether people had a pain condition or not, and or whether they had opioid use disorder. We don't have great information on that. Um, the sense is that even in the last 10 years, the proportion of folks dying with pharmaceutical opioids on board increasingly also have illicit, other illicit substances on board as well. So complicated things going on with pharmaceutical opioids. Heroin is that dark purple line um, and probably a bit of an underreporting for a decade. I, I believe the heroin death rate was higher than that. Some of it was getting misclassified as heroin, a bit of it, but we definitely saw an increase in heroin uh, specific involved deaths that literally mirrored almost perfectly the decline in pharmaceutical opioids. So as pharmaceutical opioids declined, heroin essentially increased. And you can see the net result over this period of time in red from 2010 through 2019 is almost a steady state. It was just which opioid was involved changed. And that all changed with the presence of fentanyl. We really started seeing fentanyl in 2016 um, in Washington state, about three years later than we started seeing on the East Coast. So we hit here late and we've seen pretty steady increases and then dramatic increases in the last two years. So this is coded as other synthetic opioids but it appears that this is over 90% fentanyl, or as I'll describe in a few minutes, fentanyl-related compounds. I'm gonna pause just for a second to see if Susan has any questions or comments from anybody at this point. Keep on going. All right. So this is giving a sense, this is the same graphic type as before. This is across Washington state. Here, I'm, this is just all opioids combined. Again, just to give you a sense of the overall increase in the state, the rate increased from 5.7 per 100,000 to 16.2, so a large increase. And you can see, um, while there was variability across the state, we were definitely seeing opioid-involved deaths across Washington state, and that continues to be the case as well. Again, there's variability, but there's no part of the state that is untouched in terms of opioid-involved overdose deaths. Let me describe this one. This is a bit complicated, but to me, very interesting and very important. And I really, again, appreciate Jason sort of taking an idea and making it very real. So on the left side, what this is showing, these are drug deaths in Washington state. Heroin is present, but no synthetic opioids. So these are heroin involved deaths without ostensibly fentanyl. This is for the last two years. This is 545 deaths. And these are the drug combinations. So just to start with sort of the most obvious thing, 21% uh, had none of these main, none of these other drugs. That is that the vast majority of the time, if there was a heroin involved deaths, there were multiple drugs present. Almost 80% of the time, other drugs were present. And by other drugs, I mean other psychoactive, um, biologically active drugs. I guess all biologically active, but psychoactive drugs. Um, and you can see most common over the last couple of years was methamphetamine. 44% of the time. Um, you can see this, this alcohol, benzos, and barbiturates. 
uh, commonly prescribed opioids, we sometimes saw those and sometimes cocaine. But most commonly, uh, we actually saw, methamph we just saw methamphetamine and heroin. That was sort of the most common combination we saw. So again, on the heroin side, on the left side of this graph, we're seeing that most heroin involved deaths involve other substances, most commonly methamphetamine and most commonly just methamphetamine, but also some other combinations as well. On the right side of the graph, we're really looking at synthetic opioids. The vast majority of these are actually fentanyl involved deaths. A larger proportion have no other major drugs present. Um, so that's, that's a big difference. Almost twice the proportion do not involve any other drugs. So 37.5% of these deaths did not involve other drugs. And then you see which other drugs were present. A very different mixture than what we saw over here. A large proportion methamphetamine, sometimes in combination. A large proportion sedatives, alcohol, benzodiazepines, or barbiturates, sometimes in combination. And we also sometimes saw common uh, cocaine or other common pharmaceutical opioids. So on the right side, what we see is a very different pattern for fentanyl-involved deaths. A much larger number, three times the number now, that are involving fentanyl compared to heroin. Um, and very different combinations where the most common death we really saw was just fentanyl. Uh, in terms of the, the actual typology, just 37.5 and no, no other substance present. Next most common, we saw methamphetamine or these sedatives. So a very different pattern for heroin and fentanyl um, <clears throat> and indicative of different use patterns, um, different folks using, but also the relative lethality that fentanyl, because of its incredible potency and the wide variability of potency, uh, is li more likely to be um, fatal in and of itself than heroin is, it appears. I'm gonna break this one down a little bit um, as well. Um, this is looking at age. So on the left side, what we're looking at here um, are the three different opioid types. And we're looking just among people who are under the age of 30. So the left side of the graph um, is looking at folks who are under the age of 30 and the patterns over time uh, in opioid-involved overdose deaths. So I'll just start with fentanyl. So the purple line is fentanyl for those under 30. We almost never saw it. It increased, and it increased dramatically. For um, orange, which is heroin, we didn't see it often. We saw it, it persisted for a while, and it actually declined in 2021. And for pharmaceutical opioids, we've seen some among those under 30, and it's declined a bit. So now looking at those uh, age 30 and up, you see a, a very similar pattern for fentanyl. We did not see very much of it. When we did see it historically, it, was, it tended to be pharmaceutical fentanyl. We often saw patches or maybe lollipops. And much more often now, as we'll talk a lot about, we see um, fake pills and powders. Um, so you see this fentanyl line, very, very similar shape um, for uh, for those is under 30. In fact, the, the lines were almost on top of each other until uh, really last year and the year before. And then there's a separation where those who are over 30, we see a really a large increase in deaths. So very similar patterns for over under 30 until about a year ago where we saw actually the acceleration in the rate for those over the age of 30. At the same time for the other opioids, the green line here are pharmaceutical opioids. That was the most common opioid type that we saw back in 2010 for those over 30, as well as under 30, but a much higher rate. And that persisted for a while and then was declined and continues. And heroin at the same time has generally increased over time, except again, in the last year it declined. I'm speculating, but I think some of what we're seeing, and we're certainly hearing it from folks qualitatively, for folks who have a history of heroin use, it's much harder to get heroin they would even like to get heroin, they often can't get it, and all they can get is fentanyl. So this increase in the over 30 group, I would suspect is a large proportion of folks with a history of, of heroin and heroin injection um, who can no longer get heroin and are now moving on to fentanyl. So we're doing some qualitative work now, we'll be looking at that um, over in the coming months, but that's my general sense of what we're seeing. And then just, as I said, Here's this median age of people who died over this period of time, very different. 45 was the median age for people who died with heroin without fentanyl, 36 for those with fentanyl without heroin. On our webpage elsewhere, we do have a little bit of data about folks who had both. That was a relatively small number in proportion who had heroin and fentanyl present. Um, but really, 
quite distinct things happening with folks um, in terms of heroin and fentanyl that may be changing now as heroin becomes harder to get um, and fentanyl really takes over the entire illicit opiate marketplace. So I would expect to see changes in the next couple of years. Any questions about that? I see there's some questions, Susan, and this is pretty complicated. So anything I should immediately address? Well, there are two questions about drug supply and changes in the drug supply. Do you, that might be relevant to some of these trends. Do you want to address those now or wait? I'm going to wait because I'm going to show some more data on that, but thank you. Okay. Perfect. So hang on, Sarah and Hattie, we'll get to those. Great. Thank you. Okay. So I do want to make sure we have sort of a common understanding of, of what is fentanyl. It's a synthetic opioid. It does act on opioid receptors. Very high potency, about 80 times stronger than morphine about 50 times stronger than heroin. The therapeutic dose is measured in micrograms versus milligrams, so it's incredibly strong. It typically is used during surgery and for severe pain. It has a very fast effect and it's short acting. As I mentioned, it's typically pharmaceutically um, prescribed in a patch or lollipop formulation. And that is to take a very fast acting medication and make it a long acting medication. And that's because the formulation makes it sort of release very slowly in those uh, long acting forms of patches or lollipops. Um, I'll mention it later, but those patches have to be very carefully formulated. I'm sure it costs millions and millions of dollars to develop a patch that would slow release fentanyl. And that matters because there's this misplaced belief around accidental skin contact with fentanyl being dangerous. And there's not evidence of that. And I'll, I'll close the loop on that piece in a little bit. So non-pharmaceutical fentanyls, these are illicitly manufactured fentanyl, um, they're, uh, and also related compounds, acetyl fentanyl, carfentanyl, they may be more strong, they may be a lot stronger, they also could be less strong or less potent. Generally, the raw product is in a powder form, it might be tableted uh, locally or out of the country, and as you might imagine, there's not the quality control of a pharmaceutical product, and you're dealing with a, such a potent substance measured in micrograms, that that lack of sort of dosing ability and quality control is honestly just very, very dangerous um, when it comes to such a potent product being manufactured illicitly. Um, why these non-pharmaceutical fentanyls from a production and distribution perspective, it's just, it's just about money. It's about making money. The profit margin is incredibly high. Um, it's easier to manufacture uh, you know, a chemical in any laboratory compared to growing poppies and processing them and all of that. Um, it's easier to transport something that's a much smaller volume. And from a, a pill perspective, and it really has persisted for several years, and I'm sure it will change at some point, but these blue M30 pills, if you think about it in the age of heroin, particularly on the West Coast, where we have black tar heroin, kind of looks like a sticky Tootsie Pop and smells um, quite vinegary, that's not generally appealing to the broad population. It's a small proportion of the population, people who already use heroin, maybe 1% of the population. But the market for pills is pretty much the entire population. So in terms of sales and appearance and such, having a pill formulation makes your audience potentially the entire population. From a use perspective or a demand perspective, for those seeking the pills, they appear safe. People are seeking the effects of the pills, pain, sleep, euphoria, just like they would the pharmaceutical product. For those who have opioid use disorder, they're trying to avoid withdrawal. Um, and it may be cheaper and or all that is actually available. And for those who are seeking heroin, often they don't want fentanyl. We hear that repeatedly. People don't really want fentanyl. Sometimes people do. Sometimes they like the characteristics of it. But most people generally don't like it because it's so strong. It's such unknown strength. And it lasts with such a short period of time. And the drug market is incredibly unpredictable right now. So just one other way to think about this in terms of modern opioids or fentanyl. This is not a literal graph, but it's a figurative graph. This, this is showing hours. Um, after administration of the drug. This is actually showing respiratory depression, but respiratory depression is related to the sort of rate of onset and dose. And what you can see is that for morphine, which is fairly similar to fentanyl or the longer acting, you have this um, sort of moderately slow onset, oops, moderately slow onset, and then kind of a long tail. It takes a while to wear off. Whereas for fentanyl, it's a rapid onset and a rapid decline. And that's very important. Um, you as a, a high peak dose, it has a short duration of effect. And that matters because those characteristics of that opioid is that is very reinforcing. The addiction potential is very high for a drug that comes on really quickly and disappears really quickly. 
Um, and from an overdose potential perspective, it's hard to feel and control the dose for something that happens so quickly. Um, so medical anthropologists um, interviewing people who had had histories of fentanyl overdoses, people actually were, you know, they would have overdoses sometimes on the order of seconds, whereas we generally think about heroin overdoses taking often hours to occur. Fentanyl overdoses are more often to be on the order of seconds or minutes. Just saying, there's a lot of it out there. It's in the media a lot. These are actually good pictures, so you get a sense of the types of pills that are out there. And it's all across the state. You often are seeing police seizures of evidence that are in the tens of thousands of pills. Um, so a lot of it out there. I wanna share this with you. This is from the um, King County Medical Examiner shared this with me and allowed me to share it with you. I think it's really helpful. They actually had some evidence in drug overdose deaths where there were uh, samples left at the scene and they sent them to the DEA special testing lab for detailed analysis. This is back in May. This is an example of a blue M30 pill. And I should say, these pills are a variable quality, but sometimes they're excellent. When I talk with crime lab chemists, they'll say, couldn't tell it was a fake. They just couldn't tell. So I can't say that enough, that just looking at a pill or smelling it or tasting it does not tell you what it is. So in this instance, this product, um, which was about a 100 milligram pill, was almost half acetaminophen. It had about a milligram and a half of fentanyl. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but it's pretty fair to say that if a person actually absorbed a two milligram dose of fentanyl, the vast majority of time, that would be a lethal dose. Now, if a person has tolerance, that's not necessarily the case. And if you're taking a pill, either orally or snorting or smoking, you're not actually gonna absorb all of the product. But the point is, that's a fair amount of fentanyl in one pill. And people often take a lot of pills. And then we see a few other things. These are sort of other products generally related to the production of that fentanyl, 4-AMPP and acetyl fentanyl, very, very small uh, percentage of those products in there. So essentially this blue pill, which we think is often the case, most often is a fair amount of fentanyl and a fair amount of acetaminophen, which of course can have its own medical consequences. So another piece of evidence, a very different piece, this is about 300 milligrams of powder, it's a blue powder. And what is striking to me are the number of things that are in it, over a dozen different compounds that are in there. Again, you're seeing now this is a larger volume, it's 300 milligrams versus um, 100 milligrams, but you're seeing it's mostly acetaminophen or Tylenol, and then followed by fentanyl, but now we're seeing a bunch of other things like methamphetamine or atizolam, which is a synthetic illicit benzodiazepine. We're seeing some of these other um, fentanyl products. We're seeing lidocaine, tramadol, just a bunch of different stuff. So I think it's very important to understand that these are very complex um, compounds. We don't know what's in them and that we don't know how much is in them. Um, but as this as an example, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and generally people are not aware of what's in their, their drugs. I want to share a little bit of information from a perspective of people who are using these substances. This is from last fall um, syringe service program survey, and it's a year ago. So I know these data are out of date. They're more out of date than they usually be because usually would be because things are changing so quickly. But I will share this with you. There's a lot of information online. I encourage you to take a look at it. We've done this survey every other year uh, for four cycles. We generally get over a thousand folks at about 20 SSPs syringe service programs across the state. So. A fair number of people, really quite rich data, and generally pretty similar findings across the state. So I'm just going to describe this at a high level. We've generally seen an increase in the proportion of people who report using fentanyl in the most recent survey compared to 2019. We had 42% of people said they used fentanyl at all in the past three months. We had 14% of people using it on a daily or near daily basis, most often in pills, sometimes in powders. And then we also really importantly we know for people using heroin, we don't have these data for fentanyl, but we have it for heroin. The vast majority of people do want to stop or reduce their use. They're most often interested in treatment medications, but they're also interested in other services, counseling, care navigation, mental health, medications, and other things. There's a nice article here by Vanessa McMahon, which I realize you can't read. I apologize. Happy to share this with folks. Um, around a lot more interest in reducing use for people who are using heroin, and or people who are using methamphetamine. There's some different characteristics there that are quite important for making sure we're delivering services that people actually want and need. This question, let me break down this graph. On the left side, among those who would use fentanyl, we asked if they'd used it um, on purpose. 
two thirds said they'd used it on purpose. So 266 said they used it on purpose, 131 said no. I wanna be clear on purpose doesn't mean that they wanted to use it, but they sort of knowingly used it or what they thought was fentanyl. So among this subpopulation of people who are coming to the syringe services program, the vast majority of whom inject drugs, um, most of those who were using fentanyl were using it on purpose. And when they used it on purpose, 67% of the time they were saying it was a pill form, 23% said it was a powder form. I was surprised last year that it was that large a proportion of powder. I'm very, very suspicious that that proportion has increased quite a bit in the last year. For those who said they didn't use it on purpose, they were more likely to think it was mixed in with other drugs. We don't have great data right now about how often fentanyl is in other products. It is occasionally in other things like methamphetamine or perhaps in cocaine, or as we see more powder, it might just be in a powder that people don't know what exactly it is. So we're definitely, this gives us some insight into people's intentionality of use and what the fentanyl look like. And we're definitely working to get updated data on this. A little bit about what we're seeing among people coming into treatment. I will share with you, um, the state is in the process of adding fentanyl as a primary drug um, that can be documented when people come into treatment. That is not the case right now. So unfortunately, we do not have good widely available data around fentanyl for people coming into treatment, but I will share with you what we do have. So in some programs that we are working on administering around community-based low barrier access to buprenorphine as a treatment medication, over the last year, about 38% said fentanyl was their primary drug. Uh, many, else, many others also used fentanyl, but almost half said it was their primary drug. And that's a, that's a big change over the last couple of years. I'm gonna show some more data from Vancouver, Washington in a moment. But in the most recent quarter, um, in spring of 2022, three quarters of folks coming into treatment for opiate addiction, uh, ostensibly to get on methadone, had used fentanyl. They were using fentanyl at the time they came in. And then among the Washington State uh, Opioid Response Programs, which is a, a statewide program to develop opioid treatment networks, and our group does training and technical assistance for those folks. Um, I was on a, a call with care navigators um, just a month ago and just asked them, you know, what proportion of people coming into treatment uh, for opiate use disorder or medications would you say are fentanyl dependent, meaning they're using it regularly enough that they are dependent upon fentanyl? Um, and that matters because fentanyl dependence seems to come along with a higher tolerance than heroin. You, people tend to use a lot more of it, so they have more tolerance, and that matters a lot for getting people started on medications and stabilized on medications like methadone and buprenorphine. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, so about 80 to 90% of their clients, they said, are fentanyl dependent at the time they're coming in. And that's a dramatic increase compared to a year ago where it was a minority of folks. So we've just seen rapid shifts. And some people even point to like a particular time point in their community a year ago in the spring. Who, who knows exactly? I don't. Um, but there's no doubt in the last year, year and a half, a huge increase in the amount of fentanyl that's out there, the proportion of people who are using it, the proportion of people who are dependent upon it, um, and, the, and people who are dying from it. So just rapid increases in what we're seeing in terms of fentanyl involved use, uh, treatment entry, and overdose deaths. At a high level, if you think about who are the different sort of types of folks who are using fentanyl, we have teens and young adults without OUD, that's opioid use disorder. We have people who are using opioids and often dying uh, from uh, overdose before they even develop opioid use disorder, which is atypical with heroin. Uh, we generally had sort of a long trajectory with multiple years of use, regular use, dependence, and eventually seeking treatment and eventually death. Very different pattern, very compressed, um, very tragically uh, for folks. And this matters because when we think about young adults, um, it really speaks to the need to do both prevention as well as harm reduction at the same time with, with teens and young adults, generally around opioids and specifically around fentanyl. We also are clearly seeing a rapid onset of opioid use disorder among teens and young adults on the order of months as opposed to what we saw was generally years when it came to heroin. But then as I alluded to earlier, we're seeing adults with pre-existing opioid use disorder often involving heroin. I know these folks are out there. I know there's some different sort of typologies. I cannot tell you the number and percentage, how these break down, how many people we have, what's the relative distribution. I wanna mention a bit about xylazine. I'm not an expert on xylazine. We're starting to see it. I'm gonna first tell you a little bit about xylazine. It, and this is from Next Distro, and here's some of their URLs. 
Uh, this is really good information online. So it's a veterinary anesthetic that's often cut in the street drugs, often called Trank. People generally don't know they're using it. Um, and the effects are very important, sedation and pain relief and muscle relaxation. It's a very strong sedative with extreme sort of sleepiness. Um, and then in terms of overdose prevention, it's like these other respiratory depressants, opioids, benzos, and alcohol. And the combination of sedatives um, like alcohol, benzos, barbiturates, and xylazine with opioids is a very dangerous uh, combination, increases the risk for overdose. There is not an overdose reversal medication for xylazine. If a person you suspect has taken uh, an opioid, you should absolutely still administer naloxone. It'll still help. Um, but it can't counteract xylazine directly, but it can at least get those opioids off to those receptors and help to start to partially reverse that overdose. Um, really importantly, the side effects, um, it isn't for human use. And what we are seeing are often these sort of skin lesions or ulcers um, and the, the really painful sores and wounds for folks. So um, I encourage people to take a look at this webpage. We'll share these slides to learn more about xylazine. A little bit about what we're seeing. We're not seeing much of xylazine, much as best we can tell. So we get police evidence testing from the state crime lab. We've gotten very little in the last year and a half because of some state legal changes around drug possession um, as a crime, which it really has no, no longer is. And so we're seeing a lot fewer samples. But even within that, we saw nine cases in police evidence last year, nine in the first half of this year. I don't think of that as an increase because the overall numbers are small. And this is a tiny proportion of cases. So we see a little bit of police evidence testing with xylazine in it. I checked with the King County Medical Examiner. Um, they've seen four cases um, of overdose deaths involving xylazine over a year and a half period, always in combination uh, with fentanyl. I just want to point out this um, CDC report on xylazine. It's a bit old, but what was important there was that, and they looked at a data system called SUDORS, which is a overdose surveillance system, and they're trying to extract as much information as they can out of death certificates. It's difficult to do in a systematic way. But what they were seeing was fewer than 2% of overdose deaths from most of the states had xylazine. Um, it contributed uh, to death in approximately one half. So this is kind of complicated. They're saying whether it contributed or whether it was just present. I think that's sort of a false thing. I think the main thing to really focus on is it was almost always present when fentanyl was present. We really think that the trank or the xylazine is, is co-present with fentanyl. That's very important. We also are quite sure this is what the rest of this information says. Routine toxicology might not have included tests for xylazine, um, and it's not really standard. So this is almost surely an underreporting, but it gives some sense nationally. Um, and I'll show in just a moment in this, um, what we're seeing in Washington state. This is from Dr. Kevin Fisher down in Vancouver. He's the medical director for um, an opioid treatment program that primarily uses methadone. And what they saw, I think it was very important, looking down here, is that among all their clients, about 1% had an indication of xylazine use in the first quarter of this year, up to 4.5% by the second quarter. These are large numbers of folks, almost 1,000. And then among fentanyl users, the proportion was even higher. So we're seeing a small proportion increasing fairly rapidly, even within this year. And then I also want to point out this really nice paper. I'm going to show a couple of slides from this paper as well. Um, this is looking at um, 10 jurisdictions across the United States trying to look at overdose deaths and doing some ethnographic interviewing. Um, what they saw was that there was an overall increase in um, xylazine deaths, involved deaths up to 7% in 2020, with huge differences in the proportion of deaths, 26% in Philly. Um, Philadelphia, uh, relatively high proportions in Maryland and uh, Connecticut. So fentanyl was present in 98% of the deaths where there was xylazine present. So strongly suggestive of that combination. Other drug combinations as well. And then also from their ethnographic work, people who inject drugs in Philly describe xylazine as a sought after adulterant that lengthens the short duration of fentanyl injections. So there's this odd characteristics of fentanyl that's short acting. So now they're adding xylazine to sort of give it legs when they get last longer. Um, one of the real problems with that is it's very sedating, it's dangerous, and also leading to a lot of soft tissue infection, um, very serious wounds, and also makes um, the overdose reversal. While naloxone works on the opioids, if you have a bunch of another sedative present, the person could still be in an overdose. Just to share with you, this is looking at 10 different regions. The main point here is the variability. So this is Philadelphia. This is um, 
the number of deaths, absolute number. So you can see all the way back in 2015, they started seeing it pretty rapid increases. The, the flip side, you see over here in San Diego, they weren't seeing it at all. And then uh, they started seeing it here pretty quickly uh, in 2020. So just my real point here is there's a high variability um, in terms of when it comes on in different communities and what proportion of deaths it's involved in. And this is just sort of another way to look at this. The blue and green are the cooler colors, indicating lower xylazine positivity rates, red and yellow and orange being higher positivity rates. So you can see some geographic changes. But again, these are 2021 data and things are changing rapidly. So xylazine is present in the local drug supply in Washington state, apparently most often uh, in combination with fentanyl. Right now, the numbers and percentages are small. Some indications they may be increasing. It, the East Coast suggests that xylazine may become common, if not predominant in the drug supply with fentanyl, that it's in the majority of fentanyl cases. And as we see it in the increase in the drug supply, we'll also see it in overdose deaths as well, unfortunately. And the health consequences of, of xylazine as an adulterant can be really severe in terms of wounds and overdoses. So that's in terms of the data I want to present. I just want to share with you a couple of resources and then we'd love to move to Q&A. I want to make sure folks are aware of the stopoverdose.org webpage that we have up, um, that we have some specific information around fentanyl. Um, I do want to say around fentanyl, just a couple of key points. Accidental skin contact with fentanyl is not an overdose risk. We've heard this pervasively. There have been a lot of media stories with this. They have been debunked. Um, fentanyl is not easily or readily absorbed through the skin. Um, the reason it matters is we don't want people to be fearful about caring for or responding to a person who uses fentanyl and has a fentanyl overdose. So it really matters. We have some detailed information from like the National Toxicological Association and CDC and the White House Drug Policy Office that are really clear that accidental skin contact with fentanyl is not a risk for overdose. Naloxone does work on fentanyl. Naloxone is the overdose antidote for opioids um, and fentanyl is an opioid. So it does work on fentanyl. Um, it may take a larger dose. And also, um, because uh, fentanyl happens so quickly, you may need to administer naloxone uh, quite quickly as well. Also, the medications buprenorphine and methadone are effective treatment medications for fentanyl and other opioids. Um, we are right now in the midst of sort of figuring out how to optimize um, what dose and how to get people started on medications in sort of a safe, effective, and humane way. These medications can and do work for people who are dependent on fentanyl. And as a side note, we'll be working on the coming months to put out some more information about what people who use fentanyl are finding around what treatment medications work, and also talking with prescribers who use these medications, what they're finding to be effective. Because it's, um, it's not the same as heroin. It is different, um, and it can take some more work, more sort of sticking with folks as they continue to come back and, and try things a couple of times. But we can get folks stabilized on medications, um, and so really encourage people to stick with those medications and encourage providers to stick with their clients as well as they may struggle to get started, but they can eventually do well in medications. And those treatment medications, buprenorphine and methadone, are the most effective treatments we have for opioid use disorder, and they've been shown to reduce mortality by over 50%. So a really, really important part of our medical and public health response to what we're seeing with fentanyl. Some nice materials from Public Health Salo King County around um, both fentanyl and around Narcan. And you can see really nice posters for different audiences. I encourage people to take a look at those and, and share those. Um, and then also mention, we have a webpage to learn about treatment.org that is really focused on um, what is opioid use disorder, what is methamphetamine use disorder, and what are the effective treatments uh, for those medications, uh, for those different types of substances. And we have information for professionals, for people who use those substances, as well as for family and friends. So I encourage people to take a look at that. So with that, um, I'm pretty sure it's my last slide. It is. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'd love to open it up to um, questions or comments. Susan, if you don't mind helping. Are you ready for rapid fire Q&A? We got a lot of good ones. I'm ready. Go for okay. it. Okay. Do you think the fact that there is more variability, so this is going back to your slide that showed multiple substances with heroin versus fentanyl, Jason's uh, cool uh, web telescope graph. So do you think the fact that there is more variability in co-substance use with fentanyl versus heroin 
is due to the fact that fentanyl is being added to other street drugs like meth or benzos? No, my guess, and this is this is a guess, my guess is more that heroin tends to be sort of more one population that is people with opioid use disorder. And so it's more identifying a particular population of people who generally have had opioid use disorder for a while, often have injected drugs, using heroin and so on. I think what we're more likely seeing with that variability um, among the folks using fentanyl is more an indication that there are different populations, that there are sort of young early onset folks um, and, that, and that you also have this older population of folks who have used it for a longer period of time. So I think it has less, this is my best guess, I think it has less to do with fentanyl being in those other products and more that there are people who use drugs in different ways and different combinations and that they have fentanyl in common. But I think if we were able to break that down, uh, and this would be an interesting thing for us to do, to try to look at are there kind of subgroups, and I feel quite confident there are, in terms of age, other substance use, whether they have substance use disorder or not. So to, your, to the question is, I think it's less likely about fentanyl being in those other drugs and more likely that fentanyl is getting used by different groups of people in different ways and likely intentionally using different combinations of drugs. And I should say, we have some nice work as do others that people combine drugs purposefully and knowingly, right? So, you know, um, people have used speed balls, cocaine and heroin for a long time. People have used goofballs, um, heroin and methamphetamine for a long time. And there's reasons that people use those substances together, either to prolong the effects or to stave off withdrawal. So um, that's my best guess is that those are most likely, most of that is probably due to people purposely knowingly combining certain um, drugs. Okay, question two, is the increase in methamphetamine deaths due to the changes in how meth is made or what it is made with? It's a great question. It's come up a lot. A guy named Sam Quinones, who wrote a book or many books, has talked a lot about this. But when, when I talk with um, toxicologists and chemists and other folks, um, methamphetamine, while the potency is higher for sure, and there may have been changes in manufacturing, the actual drug itself hasn't changed that much. Um, I think it is not related to changes in methamphetamine itself. Methamphetamine, methamphetamine is in fact much more highly potent, which can uh, means there's not other stuff in it. In some ways, it's almost safer when it's a higher potency substance. I think it's simply a lot more people using. I also think that there's more people who have used it for a while. And methamphetamine is really hard on the cardiovascular system. So even though we call these acute overdose deaths, and they are, a person died suddenly and they died with methamphetamine, and the methamphetamine is what killed them, we often see fairly advanced cardiovascular disease among fairly young people. So I think what's mostly happening with those methamphetamine involved deaths is a lot more people using, as well as the cumulative effect among some folks who've used for a few years. Okay, I'll jump to another meth question. Do you have data on meth overdose deaths in people under age 30? Um, we do, and the numbers historically were smaller. Um, I didn't present them today, and I don't have them off the top of my head. So um, I, I will I will do my best to share that as sort of a follow-up with this, to pull that apart. Um, what I recall is that generally the rates were quite a bit lower, um, but I, I would suspect, honestly, that the, where we see it among younger folks, I think we might be more likely to see it in combination with fentanyl. Don't quote me on that. Um, we will sort of pull those data and make sure they're available to folks. Okay. Is it correct to say that blue M30 pills are fake oxycodone? Yes. Okay. Um, specifically, let me, let me be a little more specific than that. Mm -hmm. We have data from a couple of different sources, um, it, overdose deaths, and also from the state crime lab that when they're testing um, the blue M30s, they're virtually always fentanyl, like between 98 and 100% of the time. When in the King County Medical Examiner's Office last year, I asked them this question, when they see oxycodone in a death, last year, in every case they saw oxycodone, that person had a prescription for oxycodone. So it actually came from an oxycodone product. They knew that. So it really looks like two distinct worlds. 
I think it's very fair to say that unless you picked up that prescription bottle at the pharmacy, any other blue M30 you get from anybody else, no matter what they say it is, is fentanyl. Okay, so another fentanyl specific question. Among treatment enrollees who use fentanyl, do we know what they said about the most common barriers they encountered during their efforts to enter treatment? No, but we're interviewing people right now about that. <laughs> um, I, 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 would, I, do, I do want to speculate on a few things, and that is you know, trying to get um, through the period of withdrawal is, is always a tricky issue to deal with with starting medication. So that's generally just, you know, medically and withdrawal and managing that process. Um, I, I think also, you know, that because it can be challenging, hopefully being in a care setting where they can keep coming back, even if the first time it doesn't work. Um, what we find with treatment medications is for the vast majority of people, eventually they work and it sticks, but it might take a few tries. Um, so I think that's uh, really important. And then I think the other challenge is just there's a ton of fentanyl out there and it's really cheap. And, you know, just, just changing which opioid you use can be quite difficult if you're still unhoused and if you're still in a social setting where everybody else is using fentanyl. That obviously can be a, a real challenge. Okay, a couple of questions about Washington State and the rest of the country. So do you have a timeline of when fentanyl made its way over to the West Coast? And do you think that xylazine might follow a similar trend? So we really saw fentanyl to the best that we know uh, around 2016, relatively small numbers increased pretty quickly. And unfortunately, we pretty much caught up with the national rate um, very quickly in terms of fentanyl. I don't know what's going to happen with xylazine. I don't know enough about where xylazine is being put into the drug supply and which drug supply it is in. The West Coast, generally in the Western United States, is a fairly similar drug supply. Um, certainly the West Coast, but generally west of the Mississippi. East Coast is often quite different. So I just don't know when xylazine is going to sort of take off. Um, I really find those data quite compelling from Vancouver, Washington, about the changes they saw in just a quarter. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be at a year from now, a quarter of the fentanyl has xylazine in it or 75%. I think either is possible. Okay. Uh, does the overdose data in Washington state reflect what is being seen nationwide? Generally, except for sort of the time lags where on some, so in terms of fentanyl came here later, xylazine is coming here later. On the flip side, methamphetamine was a West Coast phenomenon that is slowly moving east. So yes and no, <laughs> uh, but that, that's the main difference. Fentanyl and xylazine are sort of coming to the West Coast later, but they're definitely coming and they're here. And methamphetamine has, has moved uh, eastward. Okay. Do you know what labs you can send a urine to for xylazine? Xylazine testing. I don't. I don't know. Okay, this is your rapid fire xylazine section. Uh, <laughs> is it known if the association of skin wounds with xylazine is only with IV or intramuscular use or independent of route? I don't know. And I would, if anybody does know, wants to put that in the chat, please do. It's just not my area of expertise yet. Okay. Do you know if there's an increase in brain damage using fentanyl? Is there an increase in brain damage using fentanyl? Um, so this is where I say I'm not a medical provider, which is true. Um, I think there's an increase in brain damage and that there's a much higher risk of uh, overdose and that overdoses can involve respiratory depression and a lack of oxygen to the brain or hypoxia. So the fact that overdoses are more likely to happen and likely, more likely to happen quickly, that would be the mechanism, I would guess, that could lead to more brain damage with fentanyl. Not in the context of just sort of using it and maintaining a dose and feeling okay and not overdosing. I don't have any reason to think that that would, you know, if a person's sort of using in a controlled way and not having overdoses, I don't know a reason they'd be more likely to have brain damage, but I know the fact that, um, the fact they're probably something like four times more likely to have an overdose on fentanyl than heroin, um, and not all of those overdoses are fatal, and that non-fatal overdoses can and certainly involve brain injury. That would be the way I would see the relationship between fentanyl and potential brain damage. 
Okay, we're at one o'clock and there's one last question on where is Washington on the accessibility of fentanyl test strips? Um, I'm gonna ask you, Susan, because I think you may know better than I do where we are <laughs> with the State Department of Health and the fentanyl test strip program. <laughs> uh, I wish Emily were on to answer for DOH, but many uh, syringe service programs and other harm reduction programs do provide fentanyl test strips depending on budget for those fentanyl test strips. So there are some pros and cons to fentanyl test strips depending on what you're testing and what you're what you're testing and how. Um, so they're not perfect, but they're not bad to have around either. They do provide some helpful information um, when used correctly, so. Great. Well, thank you so much for everybody's interest. I really appreciate it. We will share these slides and I will look for some of the additional um, data that folks asked for and share that as well. And thank you, uh, Susan, so much for your help and for Jason for putting these data together. So thank you and have a lovely afternoon.